This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Let's go through and have a look at intangible assets. Uh, it's governed by IAS 38. It's a standard that you've seen previously in the days of F7. It was very briefly touched upon as well, wasn't it, in F3, but, but only ever so slightly. Uh, it doesn't get advanced any further, so everything that you've seen still holds here at P2 level. However, the questions tend to use the same rules, but in an ever so slightly more complex scenario. But you will see that as you work through the questions, and we'll see it with the example at the end of the session here. So again, key bits about intangibles are that they have no physical substance compared to your tangible non-current assets such as PPE, uh, but that they bring value to the business, don't they? That they bring inflows of economic benefit. Uh, common examples that you've got there uh, are patents, brand names, and is it licenses? Uh, we just then need to think then, however, whether or not those patents, brand names, and licenses actually specifically meet the intangible criteria as per the standard and as per our underlying framework rules as well. Okay, so when you're thinking about recording an intangible within the financial statement so recording it within the sfp uh, then there's essentially three factors to go through and consider uh, the first one that you have to go through and consider that is is it identifiable uh, that's probably the the most difficult one to get your head around essentially can you sell it separately okay so could you take that intangible and sell it by itself without selling the rest of the business. Okay, and I thought patents, licenses, even the brand name could potentially be sold separately. Uh, we then need to think about control because that goes back, if you like, to what we have not just within IS 38, but also within the definition of an asset. Uh, so the second thing that we need to consider is do we control the benefits that we get from the asset or do we prevent other people from getting those benefits? And again, with a patent, with a license, uh, we prevent other people being able to use our idea via a patent. Uh, with a license, we are the only people who are allowed to publish that material. So we control the benefits and we're also preventing other people from getting them as well. Uh, the third and final thing that we need to go through and consider is thinking about the recognition criteria from the framework. Uh, here's a test. What are the recognition criteria from the framework? We did it right at the very, very start of the P2 course. There's two things to consider with regards to the recognition criteria. Probable, excellent. So there needs to be a probable inflow of economic benefit. And you can possibly get the other one now that we've given away the first bit. Excellent. Yeah, we need to be able to go through there and measure reliably and if we can't put a reliable figure within the financial statements that is not going to faithfully represent the value of that asset is it so therefore it cannot be recognized on the statement of financial position it's the one that tends to fall down there with our examples of patents brand names and licenses it is your brand name it's very difficult to reliably measure the value of a brand isn't it so therefore your brand names tend not to be capitalized what the standard then goes through and does, having considered those factors from the standard and the framework, is that it gives them or it gives us some specific scenarios to follow. Uh, the first one that you've got there is looking at a separate acquisition. So that's saying, look, you buy a patent or you buy a license. How do we go through there and capitalize it? Very simple. It's just uh, you look at your costs plus any directly attributable costs. So legal fees. Uh, maybe testing costs to go through there and get the asset ready to be able to be used in the manner that is intended. OK, uh, when you've purchased it, we can then go through there and amortize it. But we can only go through there and amortize it when it is available for use. OK, uh, and again, we amortize it over its useful life. Uh, research, nice and simple, is essentially just scientists playing around for scientists' sake, trying to go through there and come up with an idea that they can then develop. Again, the issue that you've got there is that there is no probable inflow of economic benefit. Until something happens, then nothing is going to arise, is it? So, therefore, 
those research costs are expensed immediately. Okay, they're written off through profit or loss and can never, ever, ever be capitalized. Uh, your development criteria, they must be capitalized. They used to be in the older days, uh, they used to be the option of deciding whether or not you wanted to or did not want to capitalize. Now, in order to ensure comparability between entities, if you meet the criteria, then you must capitalize. Again, you've got the criteria there that you'll have seen previously in F7 and in F3. Believe me, they are covered in F3. Uh, so it's there. Can the intangible be sold or are you going to use it? Is it commercially viable? So there is a market. Is it technically feasible? So it can actually be developed. And do you have the resources to complete it? OK, so do you have the money, the staff and the expertise? And essentially, those four aspects there are specifics that arise from IS38. The two that you have there at the bottom are looking at our underlying principles within the framework. And then IS38 just advances them a little bit further, doesn't it? So in order to recognise the development cost as an asset, we need to be able to measure it reliably. And we need to be able to go through there and have, is it overall? economic benefits okay so what we do there is we say we can measure the expense reliably as opposed to the cost and instead of probable it's overall economic benefit because what we can do then is we can play around and we can create a mnemonic which is there called sector okay uh, if you follow that mnemonic it will tie in to the s the c the t the r the e and the o so we fudge it a little bit with regards to the framework to come up there with, with sector, okay? Again, I think some of the tuition books uh, by some tuition providers use one called Pirate. Uh, that's just playing around with the mnemonic ever so slightly and, and using different letters to help you out, okay? Uh, and then what you've got is any other internally generated intangibles. So brands, mastheads, uh, they cannot be capitalised. Uh, why? because you can't measure the cost reliably, essentially. So if you spend money on your brand, money on your masthead, you're not specifically spending it on the brand or the masthead at the top of your newspaper, okay? So uh, the Financial Times is the masthead on the Financial Times paper. Uh, you're just developing the overall business. You're making improvements to the business. You're not specifically improving the brand or the masthead. So therefore, it's not deemed to be measured reliably and therefore, we cannot capitalize it. OK, uh, brands can only be capitalized as part of the acquisition of a subsidiary. So if you acquire a subsidiary under IFRS 3, then even though there is no brand recognized within the financial statements of the sub, for that reason up there on the IFRS 3, if you can measure that brand uh, and give it a fair value, then in the group accounts and in the group accounts only, then you could go through there and measure the value of that brand okay so we would include it at fair value and we would update s's net assets to incorporate that fair value but that's an ifrs3 issue as opposed to is38 there isn't all that much going on within there so let's just go through and have a chat shall we through the example uh, the detailed answer to the example at the back uh, here, it just wants us to explain how Booker should account for the expenditure in its financial statements. So again, when I'm thinking about financial statements, I'm thinking there, aren't we, about statements of financial position, statements of profit or loss, and if you like, the, the statements of cash flows. So it says here, Booker is involved in developing new products. So it straight away brings you around to the world of research and development. Uh, we've spent 15 million on acquiring a patent. So the patent is an intangible, isn't it? So therefore, we are going to capitalise that $15 million at cost, aren't we? It's going to be capitalised on the statement of financial position. So that what you're going to have is you will have, is it $15 million on the statement of financial position? And that there is an intangible non-current asset, isn't it? Okay, if you wanted as well, you could have, is it a $15 million outflow? That will be in the statement of cash flows. And again, that will be in your 
investing activities, wouldn't it? Okay. Uh, then what you've got, it says the initial investigative phase of the project cost an additional $6 million. So an investigative phase, that's just a bit of research, isn't it? So that $6 million there is research, and research is expensed immediately through profit or loss. However, that research seems to have then generated as potentially some benefit because it says uh, the feasibility of the product was guaranteed. So that research is expensive. It's never then capitalized because we now we know we can get some future economic benefit. OK. Uh, subsequent expenditure incurred on the project or on the product. So that subsequent expenditure is that not getting it then into the development phase. Uh, and that was eight million dollars, wasn't it? OK. Uh, of which five million was spent on the functioning prototype and the remainder on getting the product into a safe and saleable condition. Well, both of those are, are directly attributable costs, aren't they? Uh, so five million on the functioning prototype uh, and also the three million on getting it into a safe and saleable condition. So again, that eight million dollars would be there as an intangible non-current asset as well. Okay, so it would be there. Would it be $23 million? Okay. Uh, a further 1 million was spent on marketing, 0.5 million on training sales staff on how to demonstrate the use of the product. So the $1 million there on marketing, that's just a bit of a jolly, isn't it? Yeah, putting the product out there, showing it off to, to potential buyers. Uh, and 0.5 million on training sales staff on how to demonstrate it. Again, both of those there are just going to be expensed, aren't they? They're expensed in the statement of profit or loss. Uh, the sales staff, you do not control. The sales staff, they can take that knowledge elsewhere, so you can't capitalise that. And the marketing is in a directly attributable expense, is it? It's just there to be able to go through and get the product out into the market. Okay, so the 1.5 million will be expensed through profit or loss. Uh, and at the reporting date, the product has not yet been completed. So therefore, there will be no amortization of the development expenditure, will there? OK, uh, because it's not yet ready for use. Uh, however, you could argue, though, that the patent that we have bought, if that patent has a finite life, we could go through and begin to amortise that patent over its useful life. Yeah, Because we have bought the patent, it is there likely for a fixed period of time. So we'll begin to amortise that patent from uh, when we purchased it. Okay. However, because the actual prototype and the development is not actually yet fully completed, there's still more work to be done, then we are not going to amortise any of the development expenditure. There we go. So that question there, even though it wanted us to explain, and we have explained it, and the written answer is there within the notes and the answers to the back, uh, that could also be a question that, that feeds into the group accounts, couldn't it? Imagine Booker is the parent. Uh, Booker has maybe not yet accounted for those costs. So what we would need to go through and do there is within Booker's books, the parents' books, we would need to include the 15 million. We would need to include the 8 million on the statement of financial position. We'd need to expense maybe the 6 million and the 1.5 million. And again, that goes through profit or loss, doesn't it? Which essentially is going through the retained earnings of the parent. And we see the retained earnings of the parent, don't we, within working number five. So as you go through and look at examples like this, which is trying to gear you more towards the explanation and thinking about how to write an answer for question two or question three, if there's numbers involved within it, then don't forget that to think about how that then may apply to a group style question as well. OK, because when you're in a group accounts question, I know it's 35 marks for what we say is groups, but 15 maybe of those marks are, if you like, for the group accounts aspect, the remainder maybe a bit less it is going to be there for, for the numbers on the accounting standards. So that's it. Just a little bit of revision, a bit of recap with regards to intangibles. Doesn't crop up all that regularly. 
but that doesn't mean to say that it is not examinable. If it is examinable, you need to be comfortable with the basics. If you are, you'll have no problem whatsoever on any intangibles question.